Oh, what this here? You got a grill in your back. Yeah. I like grills. It's better than a grill in your back. All right. That's good. Hey, Internet. I'm Chaz. And I'm Dan. Welcome to Wine and Serious Business, episode 190. Uh, we're here today with Kelby Russell, a uh, winemaker from uh, Red Newt, out in the Finger Lakes. Uh, another American Riesling producer, not from Oregon. This is a really unique opportunity we've got here. Uh, the Riesling Rendezvous was up near Seattle this past weekend. We have a couple uh, winemakers from New York out visiting the Willamette Valley and uh, nice enough to reach out to us, come and taste and talk with us for a little while and, and uh, kind of share this information with you guys. So thanks for coming out. Thanks for having me. And uh, why don't you, I guess, talk a little bit about just what Red Newt is and, and what you like to do with the wines you make. Sure. Uh, Red Newt is a winery we've been around for 15 years. We're on the southeast side of Seneca Lake. Uh, the Finger Lakes are a series of uh, relatively skinny, long, and deep glacially formed lakes uh, in the upstate New York region uh, between Rochester and Syracuse, basically. Uh, there's three of them that are the primary wine production lakes, uh, Seneca Lake being the largest of them uh, for wine production reasons. Uh, we're down on the southeast side of it uh, in a region called the Banana Belt uh, due to uh, a little bit warmer temperatures down in that region. It's a little bit further south. Uh, the slopes all face towards the setting sun, so on long summer nights uh, like this, we get a lot of nice heat accumulation for the grapes, uh, kind of just uh, an industry term for that region. But there's a lot of wineries that have started to cluster and pop up right around there. Uh, we've been there for 15 years. We don't own any of our own vineyards. Uh, okay. We have. We buy we, uh, from several different single vineyard sources that we work with, some of them really close to us, uh, uh, some of them very close to us as the crow flies, but very far as you have to drive around the side of the lake. Uh, sure. Uh, and then uh, we have a few more that we've started to contract to plant as well. So it's all around Seneca Lake. Uh, we're predominantly a Riesling house. We're about two-thirds to three-quarters Riesling production. We do about 15,000 cases total in a year. Uh, most of it, if you've heard of Red Riesling. Meat, yeah. <laughs> I mean, if you've heard of Red Newt out this way, it's probably because of our largest blend called Circle Riesling. Uh, it's a, a semi-sweet style that uh, makes up the majority of our production. Uh, the thing that we're most passionate about, though, is uh, kind of the single vineyard series Riesling we do. We do 200 cases of each of them, uh, varies in number every year. We've got a few of them here to taste today uh, from 2009 to 2011. But uh, those are the things that we're really passionate about, making these different expressions of Riesling, both as expression of uh, individual vineyards and expressions of how versatile great Riesling is. Uh, then we've got some other fun stuff we do, Converts and some some rights, but that's all pretty minor compared to the Riesling production. Very cool. What well, we did last time when we filmed on the show? The Circle. Okay. Yeah, that's yeah. the stuff and that, that was makes, good. Um, press packs yeah. and, and def definitely got our attention. So, yeah. so we were in touch with the previous winemaker, Dave, who's, who's still around. Yep, yeah, pretty winemaker. Pr pretty involved. Yeah, and and uh, exchanged some emails with him. So it's it's really fun to kind of like see what's going on in Red New, because in Oregon we don't get a lot of these wines, like very little, and especially this, especially the single vineyard stuff, like it, it, it doesn't get out here, like I think we can mail order it, but yeah, that's about it, so it's, it's a real treat to get to try this. So what's what's the first wine we've got? Uh, first one we're trying is, uh, it's a dry Riesling from Sawmill Creek Vineyards uh, from 2009, so it has a little bit of age on it now. Uh, Sawmill Creek is a vineyard site that's kind of the uh, archetypical banana belt site. Uh, it's right in front of Red Newt, as it were. Uh, really steep slopes, unbelievable uh, kind of panorama viewpoint from that site as you look up and down the lake. Uh, remarkable, you're kind of driving along and you wouldn't realize it from the main road, but if you were to turn into Sawmill Creek and start driving down, you're worried that your brakes aren't going to work anymore because it just looks like a straight shot right wow. into Seneca Lake. Huh. Uh, really steep slopes, great sun exposure. Uh, we have been working with that fruit uh, Red Newt's always worked with it since it was founded. Dave has been working with Samo Creek for, for about 20 years, I think, maybe a little bit longer than that. He's been working with them for a long time and was glad he could get him when we worked, when he switched over to uh, founding Red Newt. So, uh, yeah, that's us, pretty cool. That's a pretty, pretty old vines, right? Yeah, that's, the vines yeah. are about, uh, some of those vines are uh, 30 years old. You know, Samo Creek's kind of expanding now a little bit up the hill because they're uh, great sites and in demand, but the, okay. the original blocks, uh, were planted back in the 80s, so some of the old urban oh, are planting in the region. Yeah, thanks for bringing this up. It smells wonderful. Yeah, yeah it's, it's it smells really good, and it's got some uh, 
some characteristics that sort of remind you of Germany, like uh, a little bit of that petroly note, sort of peachy, um, and uh, yeah, it smells really good. Still a lot of like good crisp apple scents, I think, too. Um, I'm thinking more like red apples with kind of the peels intact to a little bit, a little bit of, you know, just like edging into that earthy character on there. Mm. Tart character, good sense of purity. That smells good. For us with Selmo, we're usually looking, uh, when it's young and a little bit uh, fresher, you get a lot of stone fruit on it. Uh, and there's always this really strong undercurrent of minerality that's really unique to that site, uh, which is a little counterintuitive. You think that a site that gets that much sun and that much heat accumulation would be remarkably ripe, sort of uh, really ripe fruit yeah. in terms of what you smell and taste. And that's that's there, but there's always this really distinct mineral aspect to it as well that we don't necessarily have an explanation for, but uh, after you work with it enough, you realize that that's just the way that vineyard works. Excellent. I agree. That comes through on the on the palate. Um, it's it's got a drying effect, almost like it's almost tannic, but it's not. Obviously, there's there's a, it's a, just a load of acidity on the on the palate once you swallow it. Um, really, really nice. Uh, also, just about again, banana belt site probably as much alcohol as we would push for in a dry riesling in the Finger Lakes right now. It's about twelve and a half. Okay. Maybe just yeah. a touch over that, which for us in our rieslings. Uh, quite a bit, but mm -hmm. uh, it's something that, you know, it's what we worked with at this site. We've left a little bit of sugar in here, even though we call it dry. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of perception, I think you're right. You know, it's really crisp through the finish. That mm -hmm. acid helps dry it out. The mineralities there. For being an own eye, it's still got a lot of it, you know. Yep. Like, yeah, it's, it's definitely fully intact still. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think Dan, what Dan was saying about the apple fruit, it's definitely more apple driven for me on the palate. Um, the stone fruit does come through a little bit, but man, that acidity on the finish really keeps things, it cleans things up and makes it, it's, it's uh, yeah, really interesting progression, so. Yeah, I like, the, it, it seems like the acidity settles in the far back end of the palate and is doing most of its drying work there. And the fruit kind of sticks around in the sides. I'm getting a little bit of those, those the, like, like tart fruit flavors um, that just kind of linger in the teeth and uh, work with the acidity to kind of keep the mouth watering. And there's, you know, just definitely lots of dry character you know, kind of like, like is intended and like you'd expect, um, but it's really it's it's really tasty and the balance of the structure is is in a really good place I think too. Agreed. What do you like making most, uh, dry or uh, off dry rieslings or sweet rieslings? Uh, I prefer uh, sort of uh, what we taste in the last one is a, a low alcohol style, so quite a bit of RS. Uh, it's always a difficult style to make, uh, just in terms of having that much sugar but not having it become cloyingly sweet. Right. Uh, it's really easy to make... Balancing it with acid, yeah. It's really easy to make a sweet wine that will sell just because it's sweet and people will buy that. Uh, exactly. And I think there's uh, a bit of a responsibility of making a sweet Riesling that's actually a really serious Riesling and uses that sugar to a good effect. Mm -hmm. And when it's done well, man. So we're doing the Bullhorn next, right? Bullhorn yep. 3? Okay, cool. Just to make sure I didn't have the order incorrect. All right, a little rinse. And what's this vineyard like? Uh, tell us something about the Bullhorn Creek. Yeah, vineyard. Bullhorn Creek, it's about maybe uh, a half mile south of Sawmill Creek. The vineyard site is, this is a relatively young and relatively small planting. It's one acre of Clone 90. Wow. Uh, clone 90 is uh, sometimes referred to as the Go Broke clone because it's just naturally a very low yielder. Okay. So if you're a, a vineyard grower and you went to uh, maximize your profit from growing a lot of grapes. It's not the, the clone that you want to stick in the ground, but on the winemaking end, it's almost ideal for us because it naturally limits its own yield. Uh, there's just huh. one small acre of it. Uh, I think that grower is happy because it's one small acre in the midst of a field of Concord, so he has plenty of other uh, income streams yeah. from the Concord all around cool. it. Uh, none of the Concord comes through on the wine, I can promise you. That is, <laughs> that is a very separate planting. Uh, a little bit further up the hill than the Sawmill Creek would be. Uh, this is actually the first year that we ever made it into a single vineyard wine. Okay. Uh, we had it probably six year old vines at this point. In previous years we tinkered with it but hadn't been happy enough with the results to feel like we had a grip on what the vineyard site was and what style of wine it wanted to be. Uh, 2011 was the first time we felt uh, really happy with where we were going with it. Uh, 2012 is yet to be bottled but uh, in tank really exciting as well. I think we've been nice. really starting to narrow in on exactly what we like from the wine. 
<laughs> and we have a number of winemaking folks that, that watch this too. So when you're talking about yields, like, do you have a feel for like what's typical in the Finger Lakes? Well, typical in the Finger, Finger Lakes? I'm not. It depends on the site you're working with, and oh, okay. it depends on the grower as well. Huge um, range, then. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Fair uh, enough. I'll yeah. say that we have an this this we get an acre from, or we have one acre, and we get we're lucky if we get uh, like two and a half times from it. Okay. It's, uh, which is you know, and they're not doing anything. They take care of the grapes, but they're not dropping fruit. Yeah, do you know, anything. is dropping fruit pretty common? I guess that's that's kind of where I was going with that. In, uh, in, the, in the other sites, that with different clones. Uh, with Riesling, at least with Red Newt, not as much. Uh, certainly, sure. when, if we were tasting some reds, if we were tasting Cab Franc and things like that, there's been a lot more uh, work with dropping fruit in those and, uh, and different management techniques. Uh, cool. Another one from the Finger Lakes that you might see, Lemberger or Blau uh, right. That one seems to grow like a weed in the Finger Lakes, which on okay. one hand is great because it, it, it proves that it's a great vine for the region to some extent, but on the other hand, it can be a nightmare if you don't actually keep it in check. So. All right, cool. So I was getting some peachiness on the last one. This one's largely peachiness and like stone fruitiness. Stone fruitiness on the pat on, on the nose. So. I'm getting kind of like the 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 stones in the stream or whatever too. There's like a good sense of minerality I think in the nose here. Yes. Uh, certainly similar in that way. Uh, there's also a lot of at least for me with this and then especially with the 2012. There's a lot of spiciness, which is uh, kind of. Uh, somewhat unique for Riesling. I mean, we certainly work with Gewurz and things like that, but to get some level of cinnamon and clove and things like that coming through in a Riesling is, uh, makes it a little bit more intriguing to, to have in the cellar. Mm -hmm. And it's nice that I could, I could say now, too, that there's a little bit of something floral going on in the nose. At the Riesling Rendezvous, you guys were right next to this big flower bush <laughs> that I'd say so at, at, least, yeah. at least half of the wines I smelled just totally overwhelmed anything in the nose. And I could never trust myself when I was smelling something floral. So. <laughs> It's definitely going on here. I really like the texture, how it starts out on the palate. Um, like soft, friendly. Um, I guess I, I, I'm leaning towards apples a lot, so I'm just going to run with this today. But uh, it, more apple flavors right away. The acidity transition just transitions into something that reminds me of limes um, kind of later and has a really good clean touch to it and, and, and you know if you watch regularly you, you know that I'm kind of big on the texture of acidity and I really like how that works with the sugar. Um, still a good drying sensation without getting too tartar heavy. I mean what you'll see it is a 2011 wine. 2011 was uh, a very warm growing season for us. Uh, we had six weeks of drought leading up to harvest and then it started to pour buckets during wow. harvest. So it was a, right. a, a, certainly a challenging vintage to work with. Uh, it, uh, means that uh, a lot of the wines have a, maybe a couple more grams per liter sugar than they would in other years because it just seemed to be a better, I think across the board in the Finger Lakes, it ended up being a better balance point for all those wines. So if a winery's normal, you know, standard dry Riesling would normally be five or six grams, that year it was probably, you know, seven or eight, uh, just, to, just to counteract what was going on there. So this, this is another example, this is dry. Uh, if you look at the, the IRF scale on the back, gives you a little sliding scale. It's actually just in the medium dry category. Uh, and it seems to be a sweet spot for a lot of Rieslings from the Finger Lakes. Like there's that racy acidity. And if yeah. if we pushed them bone, bone dry, they would just be a little bit too austere. Mm -hmm. uh, we used to say too austere for the consumers. And then I think we kind of got over our acetone themselves and realized that it was a little bit too austere for just the balance of the wine. Uh, Understood. For the 99%. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the, the where the sweetness and the acid levels are in this wine are really nice. Like they're really well balanced together, and, um, and loads of loads of acidity, and like Tan was saying, uh, really nice textured acidity. Like it's it's the way it plays out in the mouth is really nice. So wonderful. Yeah, it's kind of in the style of reasons that I like, but the flavors are kind of unique too. I can't say that this reminds me of stuff that I've had from Washington or Oregon or Germany or Austria. Like, you know, I'm having a hard time really putting my finger on it. Like how I would describe like New York typicity, if if there even is such a thing that that you know you're familiar with, but. Uh, but it's not, it's not suggesting itself uh, directly to other regions for me, which, which is interesting, I, I take that. I think, I mean, we're still, I don't think we would claim that we know what, uh, you know, a Finger Lake style of Riesling is necessarily. There's still so much experimentation going on, and frankly, I hope that always continues. I we never really know. Totally. The one thing that I think always stands out with Finger Lakes Rieslings uh, is this, uh, or the thing that I always recognize a Finger Lakes Riesling for, even in a blind tasting, is 
I've always called it a whip crack of acidity. Okay. Uh, where other Rieslings from other regions might have a lot of acid in them. Uh, certainly, uh, Riesling Rendezvous, you tasted plenty of, you know, your teeth were probably starting to melt by the end of it. Uh, but Finger Lakes so Rieslings are always distinct, uh, at least to me, in that after the mid palate, after you swallowed, there's always all of a sudden this intense burst of kind of like curled up energy of acidity that comes back in. And I'm not sure why that is. I don't know if it's because we have higher malic numbers in terms of our acid uh, compared to, you know, malic tartaric. We have more malic in ours than other regions might. Hmm. We certainly don't have to add acid. That sets us apart from a lot of different regions okay. as well. Uh, and we're not harvesting green or anything like that, which you know you might see in some really warm climates in order to preserve acid. Sure. So, we, yeah, they need. Uh, so there's just this natural sort of uh, you know, you get a first peak of acid in the mid palate, and then the real core of the acid and the energy comes through in the, in the finish. I hope we can communicate that to consumers that are scared of the the word acid because they think it's going to be tart and nasty. But you know, I think it's the really exciting thing about Finger Lakes recently. Yeah, I think that can be a challenging thing. Although I, I do I do hear more people being afraid of of playing or like canified sweetness. Yeah. Yep. All right. The third wine. We have the. Uh, Wow. La Homa? La Homa. All right, I got it right. Yeah. All right, the La Homa uh, 2011 Finger Lakes Riesling. So, oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Having a hell of a day. <laughs> there we go. So La Homa Vineyards is due across the lake, due across Seneca Lake from us, um, just a little bit to the south uh, to be uh, more accurate. But really from uh, our winery, we can look across the lake three miles. Uh, and basically see the vineyard site. Uh, it's a little bit oh, cool. off, but uh, if we want to drive to it or if we want the fruit to come from there, it takes, you know, if it takes a, a truck with fruit, it takes about an hour to get around the side of the lake to come up wow. to us. So. Sure. A bridge would be helpful, a ferry would be just as helpful. We often joke about having a newt copter to try to move us around the lake. <laughs> <laughs> no, no such luck. Uh, La Homa is one of the sites that uh, we started planting in 2007. Uh, or working with a grower to plant in anticipation of circle Riesling uh, kind of taking off. So there's actually 23 acres, 20, 23 acres of wow. Riesling uh, that we have the contract on. Uh, and that nice. comes to us planted over the course of three years. Uh, and from within that 23 acres, we keep all the lots separate that come in. They're on different sorts of exposures, different, uh, some different clones, different harvest dates. Uh, it gives us a lot of material to work with in the cellar when we're trying to blend circle Riesling or blend other wines mm -hmm. uh, with, and then we keep one 500 gallon tank of it separate. Uh, usually we can tell just from the, just from harvesting which one we're going to want to keep as its own wine. Excellent. Uh, and then just kind of maintain it as such and, uh, you know, when you have that much fruit coming in from one vineyard to work with, finding 500 gallons of it that works as a particular style ends up working really nice. So for cool. us, La Homa tends to mean uh, low alcohol style, high RS, uh, bright acid, relatively lower alcohol than yeah, all the way to the sweet side. Yep, it's uh, it's firmly in the sweet and the hope is that uh, ten, ten to alcohol. even if you can taste that there's sugar there, you don't realize quite how sweet it actually is. That's the, yeah. nice. the yeah. hope. Go Riesling. Go Riesling. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I'm definitely getting a lot more of the like really ripe stone fruits here, like your peaches or nectarines, and we like a touch of pineapple, something floral again too. That I'm really, I really like the nose on this. This is definitely really inviting. I don't have anything, anything to add to that. You're, you're on today. It smells really good. It's quite pleasing. Man, yeah, that's really nice. The peaches from the nose definitely come through um, with a good sense of fullness without at any point ever getting heavy. Um, and, the, and the flavor lasts for a long time after you swallow it, um, which, is, which is really impressive to me. I don't, I don't think you see that in a lot of wines of any grape from anywhere, right? It's something that I, I get really excited about, you know, whether I'm drinking, you know, Cabernet Sauvignon, Syrah, Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, Riesling, whatever. Like that's really exciting when you get that kind of finish on something, right? And and, and yes, the, the length and the finish is substantial here, and uh, it, it starts off sweet. It, 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 the, the sweetness lingers for a long time, but then there's like this late hitting acidity that comes in and keeps it fresh and kind of cleans off the tongue, or at least makes it feel that way. And so, um, yeah, inter really, really well done. Interesting stuff.
Yeah, I mean it's you know it's at 48, 49 grams per liter residual, so it's <laughs> it's uh, whoa, that's what? really sweet. Oh my yeah, god, way it doesn't come off that strong. No, I would never guess. No, uh, I mean the hope is, uh, you know, it, there's kind of a, a German model to it. If you want to look at Spätlese style, there's certainly botrytis influence in this. So okay. I suppose closer to Ausschlese, but uh, mm -hmm. in terms of if there's that model for it and that influence, uh, this seems like one of the first. A really good example, I should say, of one that probably might have a similar aging trajectory. Um, okay. It's released now. I can see uh, that. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the, there's, uh, on one hand, it's selling like crazy, which is great. On the other hand, uh, it almost feels like, uh, I think I've read or heard it called infanticide. Like, where a wine is consumed too young. <laughs> sure, okay. yeah, not necessarily yeah. too young, but when it has so, so much more life in front of it, that, yeah. you know, it's the sort of wine that you could definitely, hopefully, I mean, you know, it's always looking into the future, but there would be no harm in sitting on it for a few years and just letting all those fruit and floral things kind of develop a little bit more and uh, stitch together even better. You never know with wines, but yeah. This, yeah, this, you this, never this do. Seems, yeah, exactly. That's part of part of the fun, right? But uh, yeah, this this definitely seems like it has a good life ahead of it for sure. Yeah, and it's delicious. And it's delicious what, What's the yeah. price point on these? I should, we should mention that. Uh, well, the 2009 isn't the current release anymore. That okay. was out here for the... There is a 2011 Sawmill Creek, however, that's very similar style, uh, and all the single vineyards from Red Ninja are twenty dollars a bottle. So uh, that's a steal. That's that's that's, that's great. <laughs> that's a really good value. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, it's it's one of those things. I know our distribution out this way, as with most Finger Lakes wineries, isn't the best. But uh, if you can get your hands on it, that's a it's a price point, and there's such an array of different Rieslings that we work with. That uh, you know, if you like some, if you like semi dry, if you like totally dry, if you like sweet, hopefully mm -hmm. there's something. Uh, I'm not going to say uh, I don't like calling wines outstanding, but I hope they're distinctive and kind of speak to where they're from. And at twenty dollars a bottle to get a sense of that, that's I think it's uh, a single vineyard stuff with this kind of care and this kind of diversity. I think that's that's pretty rare. Yeah, and, and a place with with yeah some yeah. vines with a little bit of age on. That's pretty cool. And putting love into Riesling. So thanks again. This is a great lineup. And uh, wrap up like we always do. You have a question you'd like to ask uh, ask our viewers. Uh, well, I will ask a, a question that I think of a lot when I'm working with wines like this, or any wine. Uh, I listen to music all the time in the cellar. Cool. Uh, so I suppose the question would be what uh, music Riesling inspires in, in your viewers. Uh, Whoa. Certainly, That's a great question. I, I, when I, you know, I'm, I, I'm a hyper-rational person, but I always talk about uh, what music the wine's in the mood for that, that day. And it might be what music I'm actually in the mood sure. for, but you no, know, it, goes together. it keeps people from telling me to turn my music off to work out, right? <laughs> That's fantastic. We look forward to hearing your answers. That's great. So, thanks for watching. We'll see you guys uh, we'll next time. We'll be back with more Finger Lakes Riesling next week. Yeah. Bye. See you guys.